Well, it certainly took a while, but we finally got you through Heaven's Ward. It took me a bit longer than I anticipated. Yes, yes it did. About four months. Uh, hopefully the next one will not take as long. Well, hopefully not. But mm -hmm. anyway, hello everyone. Welcome back to the Big Cat Ethercast. I am, as always, your host, Ray. I am Leo Force. And, or should we say, Roran Smite. Yes, isn't that right, Ray Tan? Yes, yes, yes. I can still go by Ray. Yeah, but you have to get the full name to distinguish you. Yeah. Anywho, is it... Since the last time, well, as I said, it's been quite a while since we recorded, and yes. for this episode, we'll finally be talking about Heaven's Ward. In its, it's in its entirety. Well, 3.0 only. We're not talking about the end of the Dragon Song War, which is 3.1 to 3.3. Uh, main, main scenario quest, guys. Main scenario quests. Yes. But uh, first off, before we go ahead and go through the story of the patch itself... Leo, have you done anything in-game other than the main story? Yes, I've gone ahead and grinded up Paladin to 60. I, did, I started Dark Knight level that to 60. I started Machinist and Astrologian, although apparently they're going to be revising Astrologian in the upcoming uh, Dawn Trail patch. Uh, that's the rumors that I've been hearing because apparently it's been long overdue for a pat, for a, for a Overhaul. Yeah. So I might hold off on doing... That I've done a little bit of Monk uh, 50 to 60 and very scant bit of Red Mage uh, level 50 to 60. But I'm probably going to be picking those up a bit more during the patched uh, quest lines and then bringing those over into uh, Stormblood. All right. And as for me, I, I don't remember what... I've actually been doing since uh, our last episode. You picked up Warrior for starters. Well, yes, I did pick up Warrior and I have maxed that out. It is the one and only tank class that I can play because it's the one that I feel like I don't have to worry about dying. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Did I pick up any other classes? Uh, I did max out Summoner. I did max out Scholar as a result as well. I used that to finish all of the role quests for up to Shadowbringers and Endwalker, which I'm glad I finally got those taken care of. And I've gotten all of my relic weapons for Endwalker. So let me go ahead and at least speak a little bit because uh, Dark Knight is one of the premier bits that came out in Heaven's War, and it is sort of foreshadowing, quite literally, what is to be expected in future content patches? Yes, because the Shadow, Br the uh, Dark Knight quest line was written by uh, Ishikawa, who ended up being the lead writer for both Shadowbringers and uh, and Walker. And the reason for that was because of how well the Dark Knight story was received. Yes. So just to go ahead and give you back some reminder, Ishgard is described as a, a theocracy governed by the Holy See of Ishgard, who worship exclusively Haloni. Um, these knights are presently led by Archbishop Thordin the Eighth. What is his official number? I have no idea. But Archbishop Thordin, and Thordin uh, rules very much with an iron fist and very much led a isolationist policy, which results in all the typical landmines in, uh, or the, all the typical trademarks of an isolated theocracy, including random witch hunts. Yeah. Uh, such witch hunts included the ex the uh, murder of Frey, a dark knight whose body is basically tossed into the broom, which is the literal gutters of Foundation when you arrive in, in uh, Ishgard. Which is not a good sign for how that city is fucking run. Right, but it also is sort of the indication of... Who, it, it, it's very much a grim opening start. Uh, Frey Mist, that, that's his full name, Frey Mist. And so you, you interact with Frey Mist's corpse and find the Dark Knight Jobstone, in which he seemingly miraculously revitalizes as if he was using living dead. He comes back and basically agrees to mentor you in the dark, in the ways of the dark. <laughs> and so, and so you're you start out uh, Dark Knight at level thirty, which it's a surprisingly quick grind to get from thirty to fifty. I did that in one sitting to get me back up so I could run through most of Heaven's Ward as Dark Knight. Yeah, because that was our main thing is that we wanted you to do one job quest per expansion pretty right much. and I, I think i've sort of decided at least the way that i want to do it for going forward so 
it should work out from here on. It should be much more smoother here on in. Yeah. Um, I believe we're getting you for either Samurai or Red Mage for Stormblood. Yes, but I'm going to do DPS in Stormblood. I'm going to switch. I'm going to switch to Gunbreaker for Shadowbringers, and then Endwalker. I haven't decided if I still want to do uh, Warrior or if I'm going to switch to a DPS class. Yeah. Well, the classes that came out in uh, Endwalker were Reaper and Sage. Right. And I think I was going to do Warrior for flavor reasons, but I don't. I haven't decided that yet, and it's still weighs down. I think you might end up doing Warrior, but that's that's getting into semi spoiler territory. Right, and I and I think I and I, and I'll go over why I picked that choice towards the end of this episode. But getting back to Dark Knight, so Dark Knight in the lore uh, deals with dealing with the opposites rather than embracing the light of the crystal. You basically deal with its dark half and channel that as your main source of power. It's more you're channeling your emotions to... Uh... Well, the, the dark side of the force to the light. Yeah. I mean, same difference. And you very much... This is one of the, this is one of the first storylines in which you have dialogue options, which is something that shows up later on in Final Fantasy XIV, but, it re- but you really notice it during this quest line. And while it doesn't make a difference as far as how the storyline progresses, like it would in a traditional RPG... It does let you actually flesh out your character a bit more, which I think is something that was very much lacking in in uh, a Realm Reborn. Right. If I recall right, the Dark Knight questline actually involves a lot of lore for your actual character. Yes, and so it goes back into uh, in the thirty to fifty storyline, basically retreading old grounds and helping out people with the same old shit that they basically had to deal with in so many ways. Which really irritates uh, Frey as he's adventuring with you. Right. Uh, Frey is very much your chaotic, neutral archetype. He is someone who would rather pursue his own justice and wants to see people gain the power to do seek it for themselves rather than rely on the hero, the warrior of light all the goddamn time. Which, to be fair, is not, uh, not a bad idea, considering we tend to be the answer to everyone's problems. Right, and it's a and it's an MMORPG to which, you know, that's kind of what you signed up for doing this. So it's almost even a meta take on the whole world itself. Mm-hmm. Eventually, uh, Frey's health begins taking a deteriorating turn. And it's you start to get to the meta things of, is I'm the only, am I the only one who hears Frey when he t- says shit? Or am I saying phrase bits while at the same time? And there's a bit of incom- uh, disconnect uh, between how the world sees what's going on and how you see things what's going on. Yeah. And but... then, I think it's about 44, 46, people start saying like, Hey, so the corpse that those that the Holy Templars threw out? Yeah, it fucking moved. And, and then you find out that... And then people outside are like, Hey, Warrior of Light, are you okay? You've been talking to a corpse. Yeah. And it's like, but Frey is standing right here, guys. He heals me in in in, um, in one-offs. And it's like, we don't see him. And then you find out that the fucking corpse attacks on its own. And you have the trippiest, basically, self-fight. Because... Your own fucking shadow comes to life through possessing Frey's body, attacks one of Ishgard's outposts in uh, Corthus, and you have to put him down in order to. And you basically get the mind broken truth is that Frey was actually dead. You found his corpse when you found him in the broom. What you've been seeing this entire time is your own desire to learn about the Dark Knight class. And so the Dark Knight Crystal basically resonated with that, took on Frey's appearance, but in actuality, it was your dark self the entire time. Yeah. And he says a lot of cryptic shit, which makes me think, we're gonna, you're going to explain this to me proper when we get to Shadowbringers. Okay. In terms of, no, not you, Raytan, but in you as in the dark self. Yeah. You are going to explain to me what the fuck is going on when we get to Shadowbringers. Because I feel like that's what that conversation is setting up. Maybe. Um, so he basically says, all right, I'll, I'll work beside you for now. But just remember, I'm here. 
and I represent the part of you that wants to say, go fuck yourself. <laughs> and that's Dark Knight 30 to 50 for you. It's it's pretty intense. It's very intense. And I think that's part of the reason why, like, with that as your as your basically your intro resume, I am not surprised that Ishi that Ishikawa Ishikawa uh, got herself basically headlining the story after Stormblood. Yeah, uh, I don't know what's the actual like who de- who decides who's the main writer for each thing, right? But I do know that Ishikawa became Shadowbringer's lead story writer, but I know that she wasn't the only one writing that story. Right, but she got... Uh, but my understanding is that she was appointed, basically promoted to from side story to main story based on her handling and how well-received Dark Knight was. I believe that was one of the things. One of the factors. Also, fun fact, the thing that you don't realize about the uh, soul crystals for uh, all your jobs is mm-hmm. that they have literally all the memories... Of previous users of that same crystal etched into it to to teach you. Yes, and, and I, that is also hinted in the Paladin storyline, uh, specifically Paladin fifty to sixty, because of the and and that I'll discuss that in a little bit uh, when I when I switch gears to that. But Dark Knight thirty to fifty, incredibly detailed, incredibly well worked, and I can see why that it gets so much praise. Fifty to sixty is a little bit more commonplace surprisingly we lower the stakes a little bit but we get more in it ties much more into heaven's ward itself by focusing on we go from the macro scale to the micro scale right in which we focus on the story of one little girl named riel who is a allegedly an orphan who's being hunted down by the holy sea for some reason the only reason she is not dead is because she's being protected by frey's sworn brother sidurgu who is Sid with an S for short. Yeah. Uh, Sidurgu is a male Aura, which... Uh, remind me what the stereotype on Aura was against Raytan? Okay, this is this is something that's <laughs> kind of popped up sometimes. There's a running joke that sometimes male Aura are groomers because this has popped up not once, not twice, but on multiple occasions. However, that is a... T- Harmful stereotype that should not be should not be pre, uh, propagated. Propagated. But fuck the Lollafells, right? Yes. I just want to make sure that we're clear on that. Yes, fuck the Lollafells because they're nothing but money grabbing little gremlins. Okay, moving on. Yeah. Uh, so Sidergu takes it upon himself to protect Riel from the Holy See, and also hears of Frey's death um, by the time that he comes to Ishgard. He ends up going ahead and takes you under his wing to share what knowledge he knows of the craft, uh, given the fact that you basically carry Frey's memory. Throughout talking to different spiritualists and different soothsayers, it's revealed that, uh, and this is part something that's exasperated on later on in uh, the Heavensward story, is that Riel is one of a number of children who was basically given uh, dragon's blood through her parents. And as a result, has incredibly whacked out ether. For just as God skipped ahead, dragons carry their ether in a different way than humans. Rather than us who carry, who basically, other than mortals who basically go back to the life stream before being given a new form, dragons basically can sense themselves at all times because they're near fucking immortal. They're, yeah, they're near fucking immortal, and the core of their power is in their eyes. In their eyes. Now, their blood does carry memories of themselves. When a dragon looks at someone who has consumed dragon blood, they can see the fragment of the dragon they consumed, which is why they fucking hate dragoons so much. Oh, yeah. And so Riel was one of these children who was experimented on possibly as a continued experimentation of dragon blood. And so as a result, she is considered cursed, but she's also spiritually powerful because different soothsayers, uh, Vanu Zavanu, is uh, Vanu Vanu soothsayer is absolutely shocked seeing Riel's full etherite power basically and it and even some of the other dragons who look at her basically are able to comment that she that her that whatever bloodline infected her basically is that's the reason why she's so different from everyone else right uh, and eventually you find out that the entire cause of this is that her actual mother basically forced her to undergo this process and is now hunting her down because she escaped uh, which 
Good God Almighty, seeing this woman uh, hunt down her own daughter that way, yeah, kudos. Like, you could not write a more... I would honestly say she's probably, like, the second best villain in all of Heaven's Ward, not counting Thornton. Really? Yeah, like, her rage, her maniacal obsession. You eventually fight off, basically, a massive ambush. It's another trial by combat, which is something that comes up in Ishgard. You have a trial by combat, which basically is just a bunch of knights that you have to take down before taking down the mom, who is a bishop. And then Sidergu is going to let her live. And then he, he she does the one thing that you're never supposed to do when you're at death's door, which is gloat about how you're always going to remain forever and you'll always hunt them down. And the dude just goes in and chops her head off. Yeah, pretty much. He's just like, yeah, fuck this shit. Yes. And she has... They do the, pro, the perfect slowdown of the blade approaching her neck. And you can't tell if her grin is of sadistic glee or of true remorse that she's about to die. Yeah. And, of course, right as Blade is about to impact, pan out all the way the fuck back, sound of crows calling, and her body falls to the fucking floor. Mm Mm-hmm. So it is absolutely glorious. But I can't help but I had to recall the fact that, of course, this is a fully grown-out Dark Knight Aura male. And this petite, short, elizin child. Oh god, my 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 telling you of that meme kind of ruined it for you. I uh, know, it just made it all the more hilarious because at one point during this quest line, uh, you go to the Mughals for help. Yeah. Going to the Mughals for help is the most pathetic and also hilarious thing ever. Because aside from the fact that the Mughals, who are of course lazy as balls, pawn off their chores for you to do, but also pawn off their chores to Sidergu to do pisses off Sidergu to no end because if there's one thing that the Dark Knights have it's no love of humor and if there's no thing they don't not have more than no love of humor it's no love of love because as the one of the 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 side plot in the middle of this aside from protecting Riel is Sidergu does not know why he fights and and it's at least in part uh, because of his grudge against the sea and Riel calls him out on it for being a little punk-ass bitch at some point. <laughs> but also, the Mughals, and again, this only feeds into your your stereotyping of male Alvra, is that the reason that he's doing this is out of love. Yes. <laughs> Which, they go into, not, they don't go into a full, like, a melodic song, but they definitely do a little jingle about the power of love. And Sidergu is which basically culminates in another fighting of the Mogulmog group, Sans King Mog, uh, long may his palm glow. Oh boy. Uh, and Sidergo is so pissed off that he threatens one of the Mog Mog members, which, I will tear off your pom pop and shove it down your neck. <laughs> or something to that. He basically threatens to destem a Mogul and then feed it its own pom pom. <laughs> Which is, quite frankly, the most hilarious threat I have seen inflicted on those little chubsters. <laughs> yeah, they, to be honest, sometimes they have it coming. Yes, they and, and to, and to uh, Sidergu, they did. It, it is quite hilarious still. Yeah. And even, even still, Sidergu definitely does not believe any of them. It is a shame that we... Uh, actually, let me ask you this. Can you confirm or deny whether or not there are any additional members added to, Ma, to the Ma, uh, Mughal court? To the Mog's Guard? Yes. Um, not that I'm aware because of. Because the idea of a Mog emulating Sidergu to be the Dark Knight is fucking hilarious to me. There are a pair of Moogles that show up in the Ivalice raids in Stormblood. Uh, but they're more of a uh, more of a callback to Mont Blanc and Hurdy Gurdy. Okay. From, uh, from, from, from Advance. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, the Dark Knight story. Overall, great storyline. The class itself is actually pretty fun. I found that um, the rotation is a bit easier because rather than focusing on uh, defense like paladins do, they're more offensively inclined. I believe the phrase is they are the DPS of tanks. Yes, they pretty much are. Although, again, the other the other one of the other DPS of tanks is also Gunbreaker, yeah. which, which has been called 3 DPS in a trench coat. It, it is 3 DPS in a trench coat because I have briefly touched on Gunbreaker uh, since, since at the time of this recording. I would also say that, that in, in line to your comparison of Warrior being the healer 
of tanks. Yeah. They are the shield makers of tanks. Mm -hmm. Because that's their other big thing is that they do mitigate, they do better mitigation, I find. Yeah. In addition to having uh, their own burst options as well. Warrior also does have its own good medication, mitigation called Shake It Off, which is for the whole party. Mm. Uh, I guess I should talk about uh, the warrior class as well, since I actually went through it. Why don't you talk up to level 60 just so that way we can go ahead and and we can go a bit more later on as we go through these patches. To be honest, I don't really remember much about the Heaven's Ward portion of it. The thing that really uh, made me laugh was the Stormblood uh, part. Okay. Which was basically a love story. Really? <laughs> yeah. So, for the first... for. For ARR and Heaven's Ward, you are with Curious Gorge and his brother for the most part. For the for the 30 to 50, you are learning under Curious Gorge and trying to uh, learn how to control your inner beast so so that it doesn't take control of you. Mm -hmm. Because apparently Curious Gorge's brother had actually gone berserk mm -hmm. and has been rampaging through Eorzea. And it's been causing trouble because they're trying to bring back the warrior way and people are frightened by it mm -hmm. at the end of arr you basically stop curious gorge's brother and he basically stops being a warrior for a while he's actually like a scholar or, or summoner for a while okay yeah and in heaven's ward i believe you're basically spending the time trying to learn how to get gorge's brother to basically get back to the way get back to being a proper warrior. In Stormblood's expansion, a character from the Azim Steppe, a young uh, Aura girl, joins the Yellow Jackets in, in an attempt to learn how to be a warrior. And it turns out she can't control her inner beast. And when she goes freaking berserk in the fight, Curious Gorge sees, sees the heart... The heart overlay over her as she is roaring and going crazy. And ah. To which she suddenly punts him 40 feet into the air and into the sea. I love a woman who can kick my ass. Bingo. Mm. Yeah, but this tiny petite Aura girl beats the crap out of this Rogadin. This giant Hellsguard Rogadin. And they just, as a result... Uh, Curious Gorge doesn't know how he can control his inner beast anymore because these conflicts of love in his mind mm. while you're trying to help this Aura girl control herself. And it all ends up with uh, the most ridiculous romance sort of uh, trial at the end where you're in the Azim step. It, it seems like two, it seems like just buying a room at the Quickstone and giving them quicksands. The, uh, the quicksands would be and leaving them alone for a couple of hours would sort that problem out by itself. Oh, but the problem is is that she's kind of sundere. Okay. Like she, like she doesn't understand that he's crushing on her. Oh, so, so she thinks he's a sussy baka. Yeah. Kinda. <laughs> well, it's suiting considering she's an owl raw. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the warrior quest line is all right. It's 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 kind of silly. Okay. Um, I guess then going back to the, pa in contrast, the Paladin 50 to 60 arc, I said earlier, uh, that the Paladin storyline was finding your path, following the steps of a free Paladin named Solgadi uh, Solgazil, who was once head of the Sultan Sworn, trying to recover a stolen artifact that the Monosphere took prior to the game's events. Right. Since then, you have believed that Solgazil has died. And that he was training a new apprentice named Constant, who you basically take under your wing. And basically, you go on adventures finding pilfered uh, paladin armor like you did before. And help Constant become a righteous paladin. Only to find out that this was, in part, a very st strongly constricted ruse by Solgazil. Who basically wanted to create two paladins of strong enough worth to redeem his soul crystal as well as redeem the failures of the sultan sworn to find someone worthy enough to wield oathbringer which is the, the the sacred sword that was stolen at the start of the game right and so you eventually do so but you do not actually gain possession of of sworn and therefore you turn it you end up turning it over to the sultan sworn because it's still a national treasure right so but there is at least that arc that does pop up uh, i would say it's a decent enough storyline but it is interesting because it goes towards your fact of 
soul crystals, uh, job crystals basically imbue the souls of those who they are, uh, of those who, who held them before, as well as it being sort of this collective hive mind of knowledge and information, which they show a lot of that happening where uh, the paladin soul crystals will resonate off of one another. And basically, Soul Gazil does actually say, like, yeah, one paladin to rule them all. And so you have to go ahead and establish dominance over your fellow brothers. Which, again, your main mentor is a giant-ass, like, adult Krogadin male. Like, he easily would have a family at this point if it wasn't for the fact that he's sworn. But, like, the homoeroticism of the paladin class cannot be understated. <laughs> Especially because you now have a full gambit between Waylands, who is who is here, Constant, who is Elizin, Solgazil, who is Rogadin, and Papashan, who reminder is Lala. is is Lalafell and uh, uh, Nanamo's, Nanamo's gar- uh, advisor slash uh, second guardian. We'll get to Nanamo in a bit when we get to the actual story. Right. So you basically have the entire spectrum of masculinity right there, going literally. From daddy to twunk. <laughs> so, all the more reason you should go ahead and try Paladin next. Oh boy. I was actually thinking about trying Dark Knight next, to be perfectly honest. because Which is also good. Because, actually, funny enough, I had a dream last night where I was uh, playing the game and trying to do uh, Dark Knight. It, it did not make a lick of sense. It will probably make slightly more sense to you when you actually play the darn class. Fair enough. Um, but, uh, yeah, I would definitely say that the... At least from what I've seen so far, as far as the 50 to 60 quests, those seem to be a lot more coherent. One of my complaints that I told Raytan uh, off camera was that the jump from 1 to 30 and then from 30 to 50 was so disconnected it that they almost are completely different storylines altogether. They pretty much are. And I feel like that was intended by their design, but when you start to put it together with the other with the other content patches i feel like it becomes more disparate yeah because you start off as a gladiator and the gladiator granted does have some honor bits in which it's like uh there was a paladin who had to flee the guild because he he apparent he was alleged of wrongdoings and he eventually redeems himself later but like the monk one is completely different the monk starts off as basically a boxing it is a b-movie boxing movie in which you study under Haman holy fist who is this retired brawler and his, his the big deal is that he's so out of shape resting on his laurels is that he can't fight no more. And so you train with him to get him into fighting shape to beat against the big bad who wants to take over the gym because he's a money grubber. It, it sounds like boo movie schlock, and it is to an extent. Except it actually ends in this really cool moment in which there's an old in which this old man uh, here is fighting up against a big mean Rogadin warrior. And he basically rushes in like it's a fucking boxing anime. And you see the clip, the, the, the close-up of his face in which he looks 30 years younger because he got his mojo back. <laughs> and it's the hypest thing ever. Maybe I should try and monk one of these days. It's a, it's a decent enough rotation. And then once you unlock Formless Stance, you just basically spam it like it's Dancer. I mean, f- that, fair enough. The only thing that you're going to hate about Monk is there is no range option. Oh yeah, I know about that. You have to get in there or suck it. Uh, and I've gotten so used to being a ranged DPS lately mm. that it is not funny. Oh, I forgot to mention, I started doing Blue Mage. So, why don't you explain why Blue Mage is not discussed often when we're talking about FF14 classes? Well, for one, it is a limited job. It has its own set of things that you're supposed to do. You can't do synced content with part. You have to basically form your own party and go through dungeons that way. You don't actually have a rotation or anything. You learn enemy spells by beating them up. And getting beat up yourself. Yeah. And they have this thing called the Masked uh, Carnival, which is basically a series of puzzle fights. Puzzle fights. Yeah, basically you have to use specific moves... In order to act, uh, defeat specific encounters. So, so normally a rotation usually involves like let's say, uh, twenty to thirty buttons, depending on your your job setup and how specific you like to get in with your movements. How many moves does Blue Mage have? The Blue Mage has over a hundred and twenty spells it can learn. 
Well, fuck. Yeah. And how many can you have equipped at one time? 25. Yeah. Yeah. You basically have one... You have you have basically a cross hot bar full of spells you can use. Like, for the first major boss of the storyline, you're fighting... Okay, so the whole thing about Blue Mage is that it is a seri- it is a type of magic from the New World. It is from Tural. It is taught by the Wallachitwa tribe, which is as Native American as you can fucking get in this game. Mm-hmm. And basically, this one man who had spent all of his money trying to go over there to learn it comes back to try to teach it to the to the people of Eorzea, and he's created his own soul crystals, which are blank. But will allow you to become a blue mage, mm-hmm. and basically the whole thing is is he's so broken, run run down, out of money that he ends up uh, being hired by this Uldan uh, merchant lady to create the mass carnival, and uh, a Rogadin that actually went with him is trying to seize up the land rights. For the Lapis uh, Canyon in Tur- in Tural. I feel like that's going to come up later. Probably. Which is kind of why I decided to take up Blue Mage now. I'm curious to see if they actually have plans for this. Yeah. And uh, basically you have to fight that Rogadin in the Mass Carnival. And he basically, the, uh, the proprietress of the Mass Carnival, gussies him up as the Dread Mage Azul Magia. <laughs> You can't be serious. I'm not joking. This this sounds hokey as heck. Oh, it is extremely hokey as heck. And basically, you have to fight them in three acts. The first act is pretty straightforward. Uh, he basically does uh, two, two moves for the most part. The ram's voice and the dragon's voice, which are the chimera's moves from, right. from Cutter's Cry. So you either have to stay close or stay far. And then in the next round, he basically starts throwing these stakes into the ground, which you have to get rid of. Otherwise, they're going to explode and continuously cause burst damage. Mm -hmm. And he'll continuously do the dragon voice. In the third stage, it gets fucking crazy. He activates Charybdis, which is the behemoth move, that creates four constantly spawning cyclones that you can't get near. Ah. And then... He will cast Web on you, which locks you in place, and casts Meteor on your ass. I'm having I'm having Monster Hunter flashbacks. Yeah, and basically what you have to do is you have to use a specific spell called Loom, which will warp you to the other side of the map, basically, to avoid the Meteor attack. Okay. And he'll be still using the Dragon vo- Voice and the Ram's Voice. Oh, and he also uses a... Uh, Planes cracker, a, a quake move as well. Okay, now okay, I see what you mean by it being more of a puzzle fight. It sounds like something out of like say the Pokestar Star Studios, where it's not really a combat encounter as much as find the gimmick and then exploit it. Find the gimmick, know the gimmick. Blue Mage trials can some of the harder Blue Mage trials can be equated to extreme trials, basically mm-hmm. solo extreme trials. The Heaven's Ward one is basically you're up against uh, one of the members of the Brass Blades, mm. who is donned as Siegfried. Okay. Yes. And basically, our uh, mentor has basically lost against him, and basically he's put the the entire uh, Mass Coliseum on the line. So we have to beat Siegfried. And the whole mechanic with Siegfried is... In the first couple of rounds, he will set up Magitek bombs, Mm -hmm. and he'll fire off a rubber bullet, which will send you flying in a specific direction. There's only one spot where the bombs don't explode for you, so you have to aim yourself so you get shot by the rubber bullet to the safe spot. Ah, okay. And then in the uh, third stage of that fight, the whole... I cannot bother to explain how complex these fights get, Mm -hmm. but Siegfried's final final round of fight is he basically creates clones of himself that are weak to specific elements Mm. i should also mention that to get certain achievements like perfect blue which is get basically don't take damage don't heal use every single type of uh a physical damage every type of elemental damage and in some cases clear out specific enemies and stuff within the fight Mm mm-hmm 
it is crazy to get get it done right. It is nuts. Interesting. But yeah, that's Blue Mage, and I think we've gotten sidetracked a little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Let's go ahead and let's start talking about because uh, I have done a little bit of monks, uh, fifty to sixty, which involves uh, fighting. As it turns out, all the chakras you've been unlocking are from the light side school of monkism from Almigo. There is a dark side school that exists, which you have to unlock by fighting a pair of sexy, possibly brain-controlled Mikote girls. Which, as I've explained to you, sounds like a like a weird porno setup, considering that you and your... Or considering that my character, who is a beefy Hrothgar, and his battle brother, a beefy hearer, are the ones representing the light side in this situation. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and talk about the rest of Heaven's Word stories after you help out the... The, the Four Toms brothers. The Four, the four Tom brothers. Yeah, because in last episode we had talked about, he had, we had talked about going to both uh, the Curthus, High, Curthus Western Highlands and the Sea of Clouds. Yes. But as soon as we get back, we basically learn that Raubon is slated to be executed by the Crystal Braves and we must form a rescue operation. Right. We go down to the prison in which he's held hostage, uh, get led into a uh, trap by the Sloppy Man, and <laughs> go ahead and have to deal with a poison labyrinth, make our way out before shit goes south. Yeah, and basically Ilbert uh, runs away to uh... fight another day. Yeah. Although I will say that that was probably my most hated encounter because it's not a dungeon instance, but uh, because it's a solo instance, you only have the support of Alphano, and I forget who else accompanies you in that fight because it's mainly just Alphano and you going to go rescue Raubon. Raubon. But I got lost midway because you, you basically, after you go find where Raubon is, you have your confrontation with Ilbert. And the rest of the traitorous Crystal Braves. Uh, when you go ahead and beat them, they flee. But one of them has the, the, the basically the keys to disable the mechanism. So you have to go hunt them all the way down. And then run all the way back to go ahead and free everyone. Yeah, I'm going to be honest. Solo instances don't get aren't really all that great for a while. They're okay, but that was easily like the worst one of the bunch. Because you basically have to backtrack the entire dungeon. I gotta say, End Endwalker has a solo instance that is really in depth and amazing. Okay, but I'm not, I'm not going to mention what it is, but you'll know when you get. But to but it. I would say like most of them are okay because they're usually just one shots or a couple of fights. Yeah, and even if you fuck up, you can just go in easy mode. If right. You, if you're if you're like I I've seen what this does. I just want to get through it. Sure, but I, I I've never had that issue really, so I don't worry about it that much. As for after once you rescue Raubon and bring him back. There's hints that uh, Nanamo isn't actually dead for some reason. Yes, uh, Dulala, the uh, one of the members of the syndicate, shows up and yeah. basically says there's a very high likely chance that uh, she, she's not actually dead because they haven't done anything to announce it. Yeah, basically they're saying that Lolo Rito basically bypassed Telegi uh plans to to take over Uda. Right. I think uh, Dulala is the head of the Apothecary's Guild. Uh, either that, the Thaumaturgist. Thaumaturgist Guild. Yeah. Yes. Um, or she's their representative because I think the actual heads are like the six brothers. Yeah. Um, but anyway, you go through that and while they're sort of figuring out what is to be done with that, we get called back to... Um, Ishgard, because, Ishgard because we learned war is imminent with Nidhogg. Right. Which, they basic, which we basically knew because of the earlier dragon fights but now it's 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 getting to a precipice sooner because uh those darn dirty heretics are causing up trouble again oh those darn dirty heretics what will will they ever learn Possib nudge, possibly possibly nudge nudge wink wink hint, hint. right so uh we go back and we pick up the patch quest in which we're hunting down lady iceheart uh who we eventually learn whose name is Ysail. Yes. And uh, Ysail, I think this is made more explicitly clear to in in Heaven's Ward, although it was hinted on in the patch quests. Ysail is a warrior of light because she also picks up on the Echo. Yes, yeah, she has the Echo. She she has spot she has spoken with Hydaelyn before, and because of her Echo, she has seen when she when she first met with Hraeswilger, she learned of the history of Ishgard's true past. Now, we haven't gotten to that point, but it's this meeting 
that makes her believe that she is the reincarn the living incarnation of Saint Shiva. Well, it's because of her of her when she finally summons Shiva, she believes that she has brought her spirit back and is holding her soul within. Right. Although we later find out why that isn't the case, but for now, Yusail believes she's the living incarnation of Saint Shiva and can use this power at will. This is not just something that just she that just willy-nilly happens. She can actually manifest it as we see in one of the later encounters. Right. But either way, we have to talk to Yasiel because, unfortunately, she's not directly behind what's going on with Ishgard. And, in fact, what she's trying to do is just basically get shit together. Yeah. And what is actually happening is involving the dragons, which are further west. Or further... No, west. West, I'm correct. Further west than the Dravanian Forelands. Yes. Which is the next location we end up going to basically making our our temporary home base in Tailfeather, uh, which is a hunting community in which uh, they have to deal with a bunch of bug folk that are causing them problems. Yeah, the Nath. The Nath, which it turns out there are two tribes of Nath. Yeah, there is the One Mind and the Non-Mind. The one, in the way that it, I basically understand it, the One Mind are the Tempered Ones. Yeah, the the One Mind are basically a Hive Mind. They, they, are, te- they are Tempered nath who serve under ravana ravana who is the who is the um icon who's it, who, who basically rules in the area the non-mind are basically liberated one mind nath or those nath who never really co- communed with ravana and end up forming their own isolationist colony yeah. further north they're basically they've basically broken off from the hive mind and have become their own individual bug people. More, more of a, more of a socialist collective than a, than a manipulated hive mind. Yeah, and they're, and they do trade with Tail Feather. They they eventually unlock. They they eventually learn how to socialize, and commute and cooperate with others, which is which leads to their tribal quest line, which I have not touched, but I at least unlocked for the purposes of getting to this point. Yeah, it, it, their tribe quest is all right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't done, I haven't finished up all the tribe quests for Heaven's Ward. I finished off all the Stormblood ones. Mm-hmm. But anyway, getting back on to point, we go to Annex Trine, which is the, the Dragons of Freysvelger's base mm-hmm. at the foot of Som All, the mountain. So, Freysvelger is, if I remember properly, one of the few dragons who still remembers the time in which humanity and dragons lived, lived in peace. And at least somewhat believes in that. It still remembers the time and still tries to believe in it, even though it's difficult to, given the nature of what happened to Nidhogg and and the others. Yes. And so the basic plan at this point is that, look, maybe we can talk the dragons out of the war, an idea which Estinian basically laughs at. Yeah, he's uh, basically saying, I'm going along for the ride, but the second this shit does not work out, we're going after Nidhogg. Right, and, and the, the basically a lot of the, uh, because Ysail also joins the party, uh, in part to negotiate with Hraisvelger on our behalf. And there's a lot of inter-party banter between Ysail's dragonist belief and uh, Isinian's anti-dragon propaganda yeah and the two constantly butt heads the point at which you almost want to say make out already (laughs) yeah that's not going to happen but uh anyway we get to annex trine and they're saying we could let you go but the nath are causing problems at the moment with ravana right which requires you to go ahead and uh, get yourselves captured by ravana you and yasail basically let yourselves get captured by the by the gaff get brought to ravana Yasail tries to solo Ravana by herself and gets uh, by summoning Shiva, but gets whooped. Yep. Uh, which is unfortunate because then that means you have to actually come in. Ravana's fight is actually fairly fun. I remember it being it's definitely a, a mad uh, sorcery slice, but it it was fairly decent, I would say. Yeah, it the uh, the fights uh, the trials get a lot more interesting uh, post ARR. And they get more complex and more intricate of a dance. Mm-hmm. But Ravana's is pretty much the easiest one to do. Just watch out when the uh, when the walls collapse. Right. And I, I think for the most part, it's not too difficult or out of the ordinary to do. Yeah. Just attack him. Watch for the AOEs. Kill the adds when they spawn. Mm-hmm. 
and enjoy the throat music of the of the boss fight. Right. So dealing with Ravana, Tailfeather, and um, what's the tower again? Annex Trine. Annex Trine are more at ease, so they're able to go ahead and help you up Salmal the Mountain, which is the first dungeon. Which is the first dungeon, which is actually fairly fun. I remember going through it and it being. Uh, a good a good little uh, break to go ahead and get your way up through uh, the area. I'm surprised just given how long it took to get there, but it was definitely worth it. Yeah. Uh, and fun fact, the final boss of Samhal is Nidhogg's consort. Right, who you slay, which is not going to earn you any brownie points to, to getting to make peace with Nidhogg. Yeah, that ain't, that ain't helping the problem. Of course, uh, the next part ends up you making an extended stay with the Mughals, who, if you recall, uh, Mughals descended from the heavens in order to come settle in the Gridanian forests. Yes. Which turns out to just be they lived up here. In the Churning in, Mist. In the Churning Mist and fled when shit with the dragons got fucked. Pretty much. To avoid getting uh, splattered. Although they off, they do remember uh, good King Mogalog. Yes. Which is, which is still somewhat humorous. Uh, either, so he technically did exist. So he technically did exist. Not just as an icon. Uh, nonetheless... You have to make pe- you have to uh, get Connie Senna to make the Moogles come out to you. The most boring of the tr- of the. Uh, <laughs> of the let's not let's not let's not get, let's not guild shame here. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, but you go. Ahead. I say that because I started off in Britannia. I know you did, um, but you, we go ahead and we indulge the Moogles in some chore doing for them in order for them to trust us, and they agree to at least guide us on the way to where we can. Meet with Hrace Velger. Meet, meet with Hrace Velger. Again, having more banter with both Ysail, Istenian, who is quite chuffed at having to do chores for these stuffed dolls, and Ysail, who is absolutely smitten with them. Yes. <laughs> Which is very cute. Yes. Although, you get, you, you know any edgy character cannot handle Moogles. As, as Sidergu and Istenian cannot Ysail, and I imagine... Alize? Alize would adore them. Oh, of course. Nonetheless... You're pro- progressing through uh, the rest of the uh, cloud tops. Eventually, you get to, we eventually get to meet with Hrace Velger. Yes, and in doing so, he explains the entire the truth of what happened during the Dragon Song War and why everyone is properly chuffed. Basically, what happened was there was peace because of the whole thing with Hrace Velger and Shiva, the original Shiva, who basically puts. Uh, you sail down and saying no the shiva that you summon is basically your own version of, of shiva who you think existed but the shiva that actually existed is dead and gone for good she is dead and gone for good the, the, her ether is permanently entwined with my own the reason why i have not snapped your head off is because of shiva's own willpower which is basically a nice way of saying you're not you're nice but i'm not going to go ahead and bang you much to your sales chagrin. Yeah, and of course, with all, with, for some reason, dragon relationships in uh, in Final Fantasy fourteen lead to war, <laughs> which is bizarre but not unexpected yeah. according to Estinian. Yeah, but that still doesn't. That still only makes him want to stab uh, Horace Velga even more. But he goes ahead and basically explains. Man got too greedy for its own good, believing that they could use the power of dragons for themselves. And so they slayed Ratatosker, one of the first brood alongside Race Velger and Nidhogg. Nidhogg, who got mighty pissed, goes ahead and, and basically descends on the kingdoms of man. And in doing so, loses an eye to the original Thordain and his twelve knights. Yes, and who, the original Azure Dragoon. And the original Azure Dragoon, who... Uh, we find out his fate later on, but for the, at the t- moment, it results in Nidhogg, in Nidhogg losing both his eyes. Yeah. And then having to basically call on a blood oath with Thrace Velger to get one for to carry a anyway. Yes, because otherwise he would be dying. Yes. Apparently, dragon die. The dragons will die without their eyes. Pretty much. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Thrace Velger basically says, "You're going there. There's no talking out of him." The or the blood, the the rate, the fury of a dragon is eternal, and every person who basically believes Ysail's, uh dragonist faith ends up being converted into a dragon. Basically, it's because the the knights of the heavens, the original knights of the heavens, ward 
took partook in Ratatoskar's eyes, they now have dragon blood within them, and that has transferred into generational the, just down the line, everyone still everyone everyone's descendants still carry that lineage of them because as we as we said before in the Dark Knight story, they can sense their the blood that lingers within them from the past. Yes. Dragons being so long lived this is not some, this is something that they can basically trace genealogically back just by looking at you. And so anyone who is dragon touched basically is more susceptible to being tempered. And then if they ever fully convert and go full dragon worshippers, uh if they, they, if they partake in dragon blood, they will turn into dragons. Full full blood no stop, forget whoever they were. Yeah. And basically creating a, almost like a cordyceps zombie scenario. If the Dragon Song War continued. Yeah. Basically, this is Nidhogg's ultimate form of revenge. Basically, destroying humanity from within by making them all dragons. Yeah. Which is either a fantastic transformation topic or Istinian's worst nightmare. Pretty much. And basically, after this, we leave Isel broken, spirited, and willed. And and Istinian questioning his, his, his faith in the Holy See as well. Yes, but he still knows that he has to stop Nidhogg. To which he points to the Airy, which is right next door, pretty much. So, the Airy, it seems like it's just an easy jump. Haha, <laughs> dragon, dragoon joke. Yeah. But no, it's actually protected by a stormy ether, which cannot be, which requires, basically you have to pull a similar ether trick to how you did. With Garuda. With Garuda, to which you call on Sid, who has, yeah, I have a technology that will help you with that, but I need an ether source to do so. Yeah, he's basically created a mini little airship called the Mana Cutter, mm -hmm. and basically it's almost ready, and then we get called by Raubon again. Yes, because they have a lead on what happened with Thanamo, and uh, Sid says, go take care of that, we'll probably have the, the energy solution fixed by the time you finish. Yeah, so basically what happens is we go back to Ulda, we learn about the location of uh, Nanamo's uh, Hand, hand handmaid who had a hand in delivering the poison to Nanamo. Uh, she retires actually to Silver Cauldron. So I'm bringing that up because I did the Yulda sto uh, city story line back in ARR. And if you started in Ulda, Silver Cauldron is basically the rinky-dink town that everyone left when mining dried up and they fled to the big city. And so you actually have a couple of starting quests in Silver Cauldron to basically try and keep uh, fight the town off from brigands and to try and bring it back up, which it kind of does uh, when you come back. It's still a small little town, but it's still a place of rapport. And it turns out that this handmaid is from there, and she basically came back to town, said, I quit, don't ask questions, and she's been in her house ever since. And then she literally opens the front door to see Raubon looming at her, and she's like, let's talk. Yeah, it, who is about to get her face caved in, if not for the timely arrival of two stuffed potatoes. Dulala and... Lolorito. Lolorito. Who basically explains that, look, Teleji Adeleji was fucked from the beginning, and his plan was going to go ahead and make a proper mess... We cannot have chaos if we're going to do business. Yes. So I just went ahead, let Raubon, you know, take some, t make some mashed potatoes out of out of Teleji out of Leji. Yeah. Go ahead, put the kibosh on him for the time being. Yeah. Wait until this all settles down, and then we can put the and then put, we can put, put the not, pieces back together. Put the pieces back together because Nanamo is not actually dead. She's I just swapped a... out the poison. I swapped out the death poison for a sleeping poison instead. I have the antidote. Give it to her. She'll wake up just fine. Yes. However, your whole idea of a re republic is kind of on the kibosh right now. Yeah, there's no way you can do it with all, with all the chaos that's going on uh, happening right now. Yeah, with the Garleans, with everything else. The odds of uh, Ulda becoming a democracy is not happening, which I watch. You know of TV Skyn, right? Yes. He was livid. At the idea of uh, the 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 uh, crown staying in place, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you've ever seen TV Sky, check him out. He's... I've not seen that specific video, but we'll have to watch it afterwards. Yeah. Um, but yeah, nonetheless, he is uh, Robot is gracious, if still wishing to make more mashed potatoes. Yeah. But he goes ahead and lets them walk away with their lives after this. Yeah. He meets up with uh, Nanamo, who wakes up, 
who says she's had this horrible dream, and Raoban reassures her, even though he's missing a fucking arm. Right. Uh, nonetheless, the Nanamo does wake up. She does uh, sort of return the order back to things in Ulda. You're no longer being hunted by the Uldanian authorities. Everything's fine. Raoban returns back to his station as the general of the, fl- of the Immortal Flames. And for the most part, the ARR story has completed. Yeah, and even Lolo Ryuno says he had lost control of the Crystal Braves because he did not want Raoban to be killed. Right, because that was all Is- uh, Ilbert's idea because he wanted to take his grudge out for whatever happened, for, for the... For see, Alamigo. For the betra- quote-unquote betrayal of Alamigo. Do we see him again? Yes, you will see him again before Stormblood. Okay. So I think, and I think that is generally the last time we have ARR tying's up to do. Yeah, the bloody, the bloody banquet is over and done with. And now the mana cutter is all ready and fired up to which we begin with the dungeon of the Airy. The Airy is a really fun dungeon and I think the climb that you go through it is one of the more enjoyable ones too. I ended up doing mostly a retread of most of the dungeons with the exception of Dust Cold. Uh, Dust Vigil. Dust Vigil uh, while I was grinding up Paladin. So most of the dungeons are actually fairly fresh in my mind. Um, Nidhogg is a very uh, intricate and, and interesting boss. Yeah. Even though the I would say the the mid bosses are a bit more B tier on this one. Yeah. It's still a fun it's still a fun grind. Yeah. I, and I just appreciate just overall the aesthetics of it. I've run the airy so many times and I can't tell you how many times people have forgotten to save the person undergoing the sable price. Yes. Which is the move where you're basically lifted up into the air by a pillar of energy and you have to destroy the pillar of energy, otherwise you're dead. I don't think I've ever actually had that ha- anyone fall to that before. You're lucky for that. Mm-hmm. But don't worry, this won't be the last we see of Nidhogg. Anyway, uh, we do get uh, cinematics cutting into cutting into the the first run of the Eerie, in which you and Astinian ride mana cutters in Nidhogg attacks. Astinian uses the eye that he has to ward off Nidhogg. Which results in him crashing, but also Firebolt knocking Astinian out. And when you do a first clear of the airy, it's actually Astinian that deals the final blow with a Dragoon jump and a whole cinematic featuring that before he slays uh, Nidhogg for good and basically is bathed in his blood. Bathed in his blood, which he stays that way for at least the rest of Heaven's Word. Yeah, he forgot to take a fucking shower, which probably would have helped. I think it was supposed to be more... I think it's more of a... Uh, you're going to need a power wash for that one. Yeah. But he's stained in the blood, which is not at all symbolic of what's going to happen in the future. Pretty much. But um, either way, he has... You have the eye. Uh, Nidhogg's dead. Grace Vilger gets his eye back because that's what he actually has on his person. Yeah, basically the whole thing was... Nidhogg had lost both his eyes to the fight, and Hreisvelger gave him the one that he's using to keep on his grudge. When he died, the eye went back to Hreisvelger, but then that leaves the question of where the other eye is. Yes. Which we'll find out later. Much later. So, once again, the Holy See is at their bullshit. With the Dragon War seemingly resolved, we can't have that. Let's go ahead and start some chaos by letting some heretics into the city to pillage. Yes. Which then gets stopped by Ysail, who then also informs Emric of the truth of the whole matter. Uh, we also get a we also get a re meeting up with Horshafant, who comes in to help save the city as well. Right. So everyone meets in Count Fort Emp's manor to go ahead and discuss what's been going on. And Sir Emric comes and says, "Okay, this has to stop. Let me go talk with my dad and see what the fuck is going on here." Yeah. And under which case, everyone uh, goes, "What the fuck, your father?" Yes, and to which apparently, and I want to say this is actually biological father, correct? Yes, biological father. So, so apparently, number one, you can actually fuck as the Pope. <laughs> no, no, I have to rephrase that. The Pope fucks. Yes. And secondly, apparently, he also there's also just completely acceptable meritocracy because he just puts his son in front of the temple guard. Yeah. Uh, but he at least he is smart enough to say... I am probably going to get detained if I don't come out in a few hours. Come get me. Yes, and Lu- and uh, Lucia is like, I'll pr- I'll be there for you whenever. Whenever we'll get to Lucia in a little bit. Yes. So, 
it is eventually determined that yes that's exactly what happens he gets detained uh the temple guards are now redirected under the heavens ward the current incarnation of them which is basically just an evil takeover. Yeah, and we basically have to get in talks with some of the uh, resistance from the broom. Yes, which leads to a somewhat convoluted quest in which what actually happens is you find out that amongst the various casualties of the of Ishgard is a basically a half elizin woman who was the product of... A noble and a commoner. A noble and a... Uh, I think it was an Elizabeth noble and a Heer commoner. Yes. Which is usually the opposite of how that coupling works. But either way, her, her mother was basically thrown out for be, for being the, being the mistress. The child abandoned and growing up in the broom, basically bitter and vengeful for what the nobility has cost her. Yeah. You end up... You do end up meeting her, but only after a bunch of... of uh, Broom brigands try to hunt down uh, Tataru for trying to help invent, trying to find out what's going on. Eventually, uh, the Hound does make herself. Uh, Hilda is her name. Hilda is her name, and she is the only half breed character we've ever seen in game. Is she the only one we will ever meet? I don't know if that will be the case, but, but as far as by Endwalker. By Endwalker, she is the only half-human, half elizin I have ever met in-game. You think that would show up more often? You would think! Apparently not. Uh, despite that, you basically have multiple confrontations with the Heaven's Ward, who tried to go ahead and kibosh you, but uh, between Livia's intervention and... L- Lucia's. Lucia's intervention, as well as Hilda's coming around to assist you, eventually they realize that's not a good idea. To which we then begin our raid on the vault. So, the vault is a fantastic uh, dungeon in and of itself. I'm not even talking about the ending. Just the fights themselves, mechanically dense. The boss, the mid bosses are very interesting, and then of course the final boss just adds on top of it. Yeah, um, you're just fighting members of the Heavens War, who all basically have their own Super Sentai transformations, becoming giant armored knights midway through. They are basically becoming primals mid-fight. Right. And eventually you eventually find out why later Oh, But only after first seeing the ending cuts to the vault. In which uh, Sir Zephyrus, I believe is his name? Sir Zephyrum. Sir Zephyrum. Sir Zephyrum takes a pot shot at you as the, as the Pope is getting away. Um, to which Horshafont takes the, takes the blow for you. And dies. Yes, gets impaled by a spear of light. Mm-hmm. And says the the iconic phrase, "The uh, smile suits a uh, suits a hero better," don't you think? Yes. Oh, don't look at me like that. So, and by the way, uh, in other translations, I believe the French translation, I believe there's also an added line says, "You should remember mine as that as well." Hmm. That that is very French and very fitting. Yeah, because Horstefan is a, was a bit of a flirt. Yes, and I think that that's made more clear that he was hitting on you in other translations, or maybe only if you play female characters. No, he he's he's a bisexual icon. Okay, got it. Nonetheless, Horstefan actually dies, which puts Count Edmond in a right tiff. No kidding, the way he he tries to act proper at first. Mm-hmm. saying it was a knight's duty he did it to his fullest and then he just drops his cane and collapses to the ground that is some powerful shit it is it actually is um nonetheless it's at this point we sort of lost the lead for the pope but we basically have one lead which is as is law yes that is the one thing he mentioned before he left so um Basically, the the next lead goes into searching even deeper into the Sea of Clouds, finding a different Vanu Vanu stronghold, and running into the fucking Garleans. Yeah, they... Remember them? They they haven't been around for a while. And we also find out, again, that the new emperor has successfully ascended to the the throne and has a new general at his right hand. Regula von Hydrus and Emperor Varus Sosgaldus. 
God, both of them are going to be assholes. Oh, yes. So uh, you... you'll see more of uh, Regula in the Warring Triad. Okay. Because he actually shows up in the Warring Triad. Okay, and that's in what expansion? That is Heaven's. That's post Heaven's War. Oh, post Heaven's War. Okay. Yeah. Oh God, I keep forgetting that. That's another thing you're going to have to do. You're going to have to do. You're going to have to do both Alexander, the Warring Triad, the Void Ark, and Hildebrand all before Stormblood. Well, that's going to be a while, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure we could get you to do the Warring Triad and Hildebrand alongside the first three patch quests for the next episode. Wow, that's that's confident. That's what I'm hoping, at least. Okay. Because the Warring Triad's not that long. It's just three raids. Okay, that shouldn't be too bad. Uh, but anyway... You do ha- you you basically encounter a new tribe of Vanu Vanu who are more receptive to your assistance, and also you deal with the Garleans who basically round them up at one point and are going to shoot them, except for the timely uh, assistance of the Lu- Lucia of Lucia in who, a Magitek armor. in a Magitek armor, and does reveal that she is in fact a Garlean who defected. Yes, she was a Garlean spy and the sister of Livia from ARR who. Uh, even freaking Sid mentions that, ah, that's why I was going to call you the wrong name at one point. Yeah. But, uh, Lucia does admit, explain that she was uh, going to be a, she was basically a plant for the Garleans, but upon seeing Sir Emmerich's faith and his beauty, basically defected to get some of that L's in dick. <laughs> Pretty much. Like, it doesn't say it, but the context is there. I mean, how can you say no to that handsome face? Mm-hmm. She, she has, she has, she, she goes ahead and she's the one with the strap on, though, that she pegs in with every night, though. God, I should not have drunk right then. Or, or wants to, anyway. We, ha- we haven't confirmed what vows of chastity they have or have not taken. Fair enough. They... Jokes, jokes aside, the important part is that she basically confirms that she would do anything for uh, Emmerich and further agrees to support us in taking out her homeland. Yes. And which we we also learned that most likely the key to Azizla is within Bismarck, who has been eating parts of the Sea of Clouds, basically, to feed on their ether. Well, specifically, the island that we saw him eat was where they stored the key, so now it's in Bismarck, so now we have to hunt him down. Yeah, which brings us to the raid, the Limitless Blue Hard. Honestly, that's a really fun one to do. It's 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 short, easy, and it's it's really fun to do. Yeah, it's basically a monster hunter fight. Mm-hmm. You fire off the dragonators, basically. You fire off dragonators to to pin your prey while dealing with a bunch of bats. Yeah. Um. And basically, you gotta destroy everything before it destroys the island you're on. Right. And so you manage to do so only to go ahead and get paralyzed by the Asians because of course they they show up still. Yep. Uh, paralyze you. Take the key. Give it to Thordain. And they go ahead and, and enter Azislaw. Which is a giant Allegan sky fortress. And laboratory. And laboratory. Because of course it is. <laughs> yeah. um, which also comes with its own defense grid. So you, you, the because Thordon has the key, he's able to get in easily. But without the key, you basically get fucking shook. Yeah. And basically we're like... We're going to need someone who's uh, very familiar with etherochemical magic and stuff. Oh yeah, where the fuck is Yishtola? So the so the next part of the returning quest is to start figure, finding more braves. Um, you, the, 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 Mon Britta and Yishtola are the only two of the braves who would have been able to have that potential anyway. Since Mon Britta's dead, the only hope is if we can actually find Yishtola, who we eventually do find out did make it out, but she did so using a spell in which she basically transferred herself into the life stream willy-nilly. Yeah. Now, going back to ARR for a second, recall that they basically explained the teleportation system as such as that Etherite basically lets you transfer stuff and people through the life stream using Etherite as basically two points on a grid. Yes. You can transfer yourself without those... The problem is you end up risk basically staying in the ether, in the live stream for good if you don't have a way to pull yourself back out, which Ishtola did not have at all. Without and without a without a starting point to to mark herself and without an end point to land, she basically ended up teleporting herself into the live stream, getting away from the cave in that would have killed her, but not actually getting out. Yeah, and so communications with Connie Center are once again required. 
in which we also require the help of uh, Yishtola's uh, little sister, Yimithra. Under the, under the guise of a blood relative would ha- be able to act as an anchor for the three, for the three high uh, uh, spells... Uh, seat seers. Seat seers to be able to basically pull her out. Yeah. Which they managed to do so. Naked. <laughs> well, of course, you know, clothes can't transfer through. However, um, in doing so, they managed to go ahead and bring out Yashtola, who's a little bit different. Yeah, her eyes are a little off. What is about that? Uh, we don't find out till much later that this is a cost of using that particular spell to get away, as well as new magics that she's been temp- uh, she had been uh, m- messing with prior to the Bloody Banquet. Right. Um, we get some side quests uh, while Yashtola is recovering for uh, Tatari to basically get her... A new weapon and new dreads. Which or new threads? What, which? What do you think of her new look? It's good, but we are not near the her pe- iconic eye outfit yet. Yeah, we're not near the perfection that is her Shadowbringers outfit. Right. So this will tide us over for now. Um, Yashtola goes and says that she doesn't have that potential still, but her master would. Master Matoya, who is currently uh, taking up residence in the former Charlian base of operations that had set up in Dravania. Right. So we go there, find out that, of course, it's been abandoned for so many years. It's currently being taken over by a bunch, but basically a collaboration of different races, goblins here, Elizin, basically anyone who wants to go ahead and set up shop there. Yeah, it's basically, as the goblins say, it's their idealized society. But, uh, basically, they want to make Byzantium, if, of all things, if you can believe that. Yeah. Uh, nonetheless, you actually have to entertain them a little bit before they're willing to clear the path for you, which almost has a little bit of a uh, Hildegard brand charm to it because they basically they they basically had the area walled off and have to clear it with bombs, <laughs> to which they don't warn you, and you end up running away while everyone's already cleared the blast zone by the time you're. Gormless ass figures it out. <laughs> oh yeah, th- I forgot about that. That is funny. So, but anyway, you make your way further and you find your way to Matoya's cave, who is a salty old woman, as as fits her right, and even ch- even chides in uh, Alfino about knowing her, uh, knowing his grandpa, which is all the more hilarious because she she ch- uh, chides him about his about her age and sk- about his age and skill. Yeah. <laughs> so. All, all the more, she agrees to to do the translations, but the book is actually located in the Great Google Library still. Which is heavily guarded and... Requires a dungeon run to, to retrieve the book necessary. Speaking of, what did you think of the Great Google Library? That's a fantastic dungeon also. I, I really enjoyed that one too. Um, favorite mini-boss by far is Biblios, who is this uh, part dragon, part behemoth spirit... Who basically gets mad. He has an involuntary period. In which he can't be harmed. Because he's drawing on the magics of his book that he came from. The only way to get him out. Is by defeating two page 64 enemies. Who combust. And then dragging that combustion book. Into Biblios. And he gets so mad because you're spilling ink all o- oil and ink all over the place. And ruining the texts. Yeah. So despite this being massive dragon spirit being here. He is a massive fucking nerd like the rest of the residents in this in this dungeon. Yeah, and of course you've also got the, a demon wall reskin as the demon tome. Right, who it was an interesting boss in and of itself. Although I do it, I do. I was half expecting him to like creep on forward, uh, like the demon wall, but no, he just does a, a front facing full clear almost insta kill attack, which you dodge by running around. Yeah. Him. By the way, there's actually a hard version of the Great Google Library that Ooh. has a different final boss. Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah, and the the Demon Tome actually comes out of the book. Oh, okay. As the first boss. Oh, that's interesting. I did know that there was a rematch because um, a friend of mine basically told me that when you fight Biblios the second time, he does remember you and he gets more mad about you spilling oil everywhere. Yeah. So I did know at least there was a second running of it. I just haven't come across it yet. Um... So you go through the Great Google Library. Uh, all this time, I've been for, we've been forgetting to mention since the pa- since the patch quest of ARR, you have been disconnected from the Blessing of Light. Yeah. Uh, in part because Medgar wants to test your will, and so throughout the throughout the event the entirety of Heaven's Ward, you have been reconnecting your blessings with Heidelin, and I think it's 
you are five six of the way there by the time you finish Great Google Library. Yes. And so um, you are at the end of your redemption arc before you go ahead and you continue on returning to Matoya, who goes ahead, does the translations for you, and also chides Yishtola for getting blinded by basically uncovering what is essentially a forbidden spell. The whole life stream jump was basically forbidden magic for a reason. Yeah. And her blinding is at least a consequence of that. Yeah, she is blind. She uses her ether to see through, see everything now. She can see everything around her, but it's more like an etheric outline of everything. Does this cost... Does this do anything for her will? It's... Basically, it says it's supposed to shorten her lifespan, but I believe the actual translation is, is that she's constantly exerting her ether to use use that ability. So it's just putting a strain on her. She also uses this in her combat as in a solo instance you have to do for Idleshire. Uh, she basically summons a massive explosion to drop on an enemy mech. Yeah. <laughs> so she also can do that now, apparently, for some reason. Oh, yeah, she's starting to become a black mage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that more or less deals with the means to break into Aziz Law, but you still need a power source for it. Well, thankfully, we've got one heck of a one with Ni with Astinian holding the Eye of Nidhogg. Who, after some cajoling from Alphano and Emmerich, basically agrees to accompany the party using and using the Eye as an etheric ram. As an etheric drill to pierce through the heavens into Azislaw. To which the Garleans are quickly following suit. Yes, and basically lay into an ambush for you. It, only for Yasail and Hreisvelger to come in save the day. And Yasail donning Shiva's mantle one last time to go ahead and fuck with the Garleans again. Yep. She does die, I think? She's dead. She's dead. She's dead. Okay. So she, she, she sacrifices herself to save us. She does sacrifice her, herself to save us, even getting respect out of Astinian in the end. Yeah, which is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, so you end up in the Azizla, uh Fortress slash Great uh, Etheric Laboratory area. Yeah. In which a bunch of, of monstrous experimentations have been going on for at least 5,000 years. Pretty much. Which includes the creation of Lamias, Chimeras, um, I'm trying to remember what other m monstrous hybrid creatures have existed in that time. Yeah. But basically a bunch of crazy wild experiments have been running amok for 5,000 years. And also there's robots. Yeah. There's plenty of robots. It's Alligan. Mm-hmm. Don't be surprised. <sighs> it's always the Alligans. And funny enough, by the time uh, you get, you do run into, um... What is the general's name again? Oh, Regula. Reg you run into Regula here as well. You have a bot. You have a, a solo fight with him. Uh, an instance fight with him. Yeah. Which is actually pretty funny. It reminds me of the, uh, not Balesar fight, but the first guy with the massive gauntlet gloves. Oh, uh, Ridian. Ridian. It it reminds me of the Ridian fight a lot, with explosions, dropping containers. Eventually, he just says, screw the rules, why am I fighting? Let me just throw my entire army at you. Yeah. And so basically, Astinian, Alphano, and the others cover for you while you go ahead and explore deeper in. Which, al which allows you to get in deeper and deeper, in which you run across Tiamat. Which is a surprising twist, given Tiamat's usual, I guess, um, she's usually very much hyped up, being, in, in most depictions, the counterpart to, she is a brood sisters with Bahamut, but she almost takes an antithetical appearance to him. But whereas Bahamut was imprisoned in the moon, with no, no. Here's the th here's here's. Let me uh, clear some stuff up okay. for you. Bahamut was killed. Yes, he, he was flat out killed. Yes, Tiamat was tempted by the Asians to revive him. Right, which created the primal Bahamut. Okay, which then got sealed in Dalamud. Okay. Yes. But still, it very much contrasting sides. And even then, she herself is a prisoner of the of the Allegans. But not a, not against her will, pretty much. Mm -hmm. She is basically... Taking her penance on the chin. Pretty much. Um, and there's some banter with her in Midgard Salmer, which ends up being the final uh, moment to, re to break through his last barrier and reconnect the Warrior of Light with Heidelin. In which Midgard Salmer... Uh, acknowledges it, respects you for it, 
and allows you to ride on him. And he becomes your flying mount for the rest for to get to the next part of uh, As his law. As his law because you actually have to fly and therefore all of the main quests up to this point have been unlocking ether currents for you. Yeah, which is lucky cuz I would not want to try to get ether currents in As his law. Yeah, no. I I the, I saw the quest in that area. I'm like, "No, thank you. I'm just trying to speed run to the end." Yeah, thankfully you get the flying ability right away. You hop on you hop on Mitty's back and you fly to the Etherochemical Research Facility, which is your final dungeon, which leads into the final instance fight. Uh, that dungeon is also I, this is the one I have seen you clear before uh, because it ends in a double Ashian fight. Yep. Honestly, it's a fanta- it's a fantastic encounter. All said and done, the Ashian Prime fight is also entertaining and really, like, it does a proper build-up where fighting the first two Ashians, they have fire and ice magic, which causes different AoE effects. Yeah. And then they combine the two together in the Prime form, which requires you to go ahead and learn from what you build on prior. Yeah. you basic- They basically have, like, two forms of the balls, like fire and ice balls, coming together, and depending on how close the tether is, you... Or indicates to you which ones go off first. Uh, well, not just that, but then the combination of whether it's fire, or whether it's fi- both fire, both ice, or a combination of the two impacts also the the. It's either fire or ice, but the positions of the fire and ice change. Okay. Yeah. Ice... Well, because well, it's because remember in the first in the first fight it's it's either it's one element. Yes. And then in the second fight, then they actually start merging them together. Yeah. And so that does impact which ones go off when and, and the radiuses and whatnot. But yeah. it, it's all, it all builds on itself, and it's all very inter- intriguing altogether. Uh, we <laughs> should mention that prior to this, yes. Urianje had given us a, a gift from Moonbrida. A spare white aura site that she kept just for emergency's sake. Yes. Uh, which we used to go ahead and, ki- and imprison... Igiorm. Igiorm and successfully purge from the life stream. Mm-hmm. As far as uh, La Habrea, who thinks that he's going to get away with it, in comes the Pope himself... With a coffin. With a coffin of the first Azure Dragoon, who also happens to be carrying the other Eye of Nidhogg. Because he could not find a way to get rid of it and ended up merging with it. And decided to go ahead, transform himself into his primal form. King Thornton. King Thornton, taking the corpse of the first Azure Pal- Azure Dragoon and the remaining Eye of Nidhogg, turning it into a holy sword, and then smoting the fuck out of La Habrea. Yep, La Habrea is done and dusted. I am honestly surprised they went ahead and dusted La Habrea that much, considering everyone wants to get their hands on him. Yeah. So that's kind of... An- I feel like that's slightly anticlimactic, but at the same time, it just shows how much more of, how much of a threat they at least wanted to make Thordain. Yeah. So Thordain basically says, challenge me in the reactor room if you fucking dare. Yep. And so then begins the Singularity Reactor, the fight against King Thordain and his Knights 12. Which, is, which, is, a, which is a dungeon trial. It is, uh, is or, the final trial uh, of, of Base Heaven's Room. Which, which, is, which is a trial, uh, is what I meant to say. And a heck of a trial it is. Yeah. A really fun fight. Um, definitely gives me Knights of the Twelve in, uh, energy. Um, honestly, a little easy at this point, but I don't know if that was just me it or... Is, it is, it is. You, you weren't doing it. Here's the thing. If you wanted a real challenge, you should have done it at minimum eye level. At minimum eye level? Minimum item level. Oh, minimum item level. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, it's just called min eye level. Okay, got it. Yeah, that will make it so you are just at bare base eye level for that fight okay which makes it a lot more harder okay but honestly like it was a fantastic way to end that series and it ends the the actual ending cinematic actually gives me more questions than answers because thorday we, we get a brief like pov from thorday's perspective yeah. and you just see the warrior of light in black like a freaking jojo shadow just menacingly staring down at Thorne, and he's like, what the fuck are you? I'm the motherfucker who killed you because you killed my best friend! And I imagine this is what you meant by we'll get answers more once we get to Heaven's... Not Heaven's Word, uh, uh, Shadow... Shadow, uh... Shadowbringers. Shadowbringers. I keep wanting to say Shadow Walker, but I know that's not... That's like a, that's a portmanteau of two different things. Yeah, no, 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 no. Sha- but, but through uh, Shadowbringer, we'll probably have more answers because... Uh, the, te- the stinger at the end of the cinematic is 
one of the is a new Ashian. Well, one you've met before, Elidimus. Elidimus basically saying, "Okay, the warriors of the warriors of light had had their time. Darkness, it's your turn now." Yeah, but before that happens, Estinian Estinian gets the second eye is going to go ahead and put them out of their misery, and then Nidhogg just decides to take over his fucking body. Yeah, because he was covered in his blood, because he had been slowly being, his will had slowly been being uh, ebbed away by the prior eye, having two eyes in his possession was just too much for him to handle. And so he transforms into Nidhogg outright, and then flies the fuck off. Yep, and then we return to Ishgar on Midi's back, who talks to Emric, saying... Do not celebrate just yet. The war is far from over. Nidhogg has returned, and he will be coming for his bloody vengeance. However, at the very least, he can go ahead and sign a peace treaty with the rest of the Age Orzean Three, uh, putting him in sync with Ulda, uh, Gridania, and Limsa Lominsa. Yes. Uh, Emric is currently p- being the current representative. Uh, I, think he is, I think he is actually recognized as the new Archbishop. Which he does not want to be. Which he does not want to be, but tech, but as far as politically, because of the fact that the country needs stability, and technically, because although it's not how it should function, because it's a theocracy and not a monarchy, he is the next one in line because he is the sort of heir to the throne, whether by blood or by right. Pretty much. Since we killed also all of the Heavensward knights. Yeah, they too, ain't coming back. Too, so that also is so... Just, he's, the per, he's the right man for the job. Yeah, he's the right man for the job in the right place. Mm-hmm. And so he joins the Eorzean Alliance, and so... And then our actual ending uh, cinematic is us making a memorial for Horshafant, uh by the Camp Dragonhead? Yeah, it's by Camp Dragonhead. By Camp Dragonhead, uh, laying his shield to rest and agreeing that we need to go ahead and now focus on restoring the Crystal Braves. Not really. Well, get, not the Crystal Braves, the Scions. Re, 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 about uh, re-raising the Scions, to which Atara explains they're going to need a lot more money. Yes. Insert Joe Cat meme image here. Yes. But yeah, that's pretty much Heaven's Ward uh, 3.0. Yeah. So, first off, what are your overall thoughts on the expansion? Okay, this is the one in which now I can see, once we got past the beginning chuff, now I can see why people said, yeah, the story for Heaven's Ward is absolutely fantastic. I honestly think that this is a much better way. I'm, gl- I'm sorry we had to go through ARR to get to this point, but you know what? I can at least see the hype now. All right. Favorite character? Um, or favorite characters? I would say that at least my favorite characters would probably need to be... Um, I will give my top three. It's going to be... Uh, Horsh- it's going it, not Horshafon. It's going to be uh, Count Edmond yeah. because his narration at the first start of every new series and at the end at, at every story beat is peak. Yeah, rest in peace. By the way, his voice actor died. Uh, um, I will also say it's uh, Frey Mist. It really just spot on um, story work for his arc introducing the character to Dark Knight. And then probably number three would probably need to be Yasail. Okay. Uh, just to her overall redemption from villain to basically playing anti-hero by the end is just absolutely brilliant. By the way, the, the guy who created Yasail has a, has apparently has a bad history of fridging characters who are Shiva. Hmm. Because he's also the one who, did, who made uh, uh, the Shiva character in Final Fantasy sixteen. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, and she got fridged as well, kinda. I mean, it's only fitting, considering she's the goddess of ice. Yeah. Um, okay. (laughs) But yeah. Alright, so, overall, what was your favorite moment of Heaven's World so far? I mean, it's gonna be bittersweet as ever, but it's going to be fucking the end of the vault. It it can't be anything else. Yeah, I I, I cannot blame you for that. I kind of got spoiled on... Uh, the destructions of the two Ashians. Otherwise, I probably would put it at that because yeah, see, that was probably my fault. Well, that, because I did, I didn't know, and I still was on the fence about doing Final Fantasy fourteen to begin with. But seeing, I would say that comes in second because understanding everything we had to go through just to put away one of them. 
Yeah. And then not only doing it with ease with um, Iggy Orm. Iggy Orm, and then seeing Thordain do it so effortlessly with La Habrea, it kind of is a holy shit, these things can be killed. More than just a one off than we did in the in the post AR quests. Right. All right, I can see it. But yeah, I, I, I can't blame you for the vaults ending being like the big heavy hitter. Cause, yeah. Because I've seen so many people's reactions to the vault and it always hits them like a ton of bricks. Yeah, and I think it's rightly deserved. Yeah. All right, and so favorite dungeon? Um, I'm going to say Great Google Library. I definitely think I think I enjoyed that one the most. Some all is still pretty good too. I think I just should have come in sooner. Um, yeah, that's what I would, that definitely, that's what I would have to say about that. All right, that's good. And favorite boss fight? So, boss. I'm, these are the trials. So, right. Ravana, uh, Bismarck, or Thordin? Uh, Thordin, easily, without a question. All right. Uh-huh. Yeah, because I can't really think of, like, the names of some of the dungeon bosses. Even then, like, most of the dungeon bosses are not that good. With Maybe the only one that I would say is the living, uh... The, the living book guardian in the Great Google Library. But I it's an okay fight, but I would say Nidhogg is probably the better regular dungeon fight if it's not a trial. Right. And for both story reasons and just mechanically speaking. Okay, and then I guess I kind of you kind of answered this already, but how does this compare to ARR? I mean, this is this is what people are talking about when they say the meme about Final Fantasy XIV being the uh, critically acclaimed RPG. This is where we're, where we're like, okay, now we're actually talking the language now. Yeah, now you get why it's called the award-winning expansion he- Heaven's Ward. Right, and you, want he- and you have to put Heaven's Ward as the feature because that's actually the good shit. Because ARR is, is, is actually a drag to get through. Yes, look. Although I will say... The, the building blocks are in ARR. Yes. They will come back in a big deal in future expansions. They you, do. And, and I, I think it's also just my relative inexperience with MMOs that was part of, like, the such a deterrent to me getting here to this point because of the fact that I'm not into in the grind and starting off from, I guess, a, por- a position of relative unknownness meant that it took me a while to sort of understand how certain things work. Yeah. I wonder if I could have explained this better in the, in the past to uh, get you into this sooner. I don't think so, and I think, like, Part of it was, bear in mind that you got into this during COVID started. I didn't start till post-COVID. And so part of that issue was that I didn't have... You, you did it on PS5 because that was the machine that worked better for well, you. Well, PS4 first and then I jumped to PS5. Right. And so for me, I didn't really want to do that on my PlayStation at the time. So I put it on my PC. And the PC that I had prior to... Uh, post-COVID was not the best. I eventually did get a better one, and that one is what I'm playing it on now, and it runs magnificently. And so, really, it was just down to... Part, it was partly a mechanical experience, which could have been mitigated, but then I wouldn't be able to do it on PC, which is where a lot more of uh, the people who are helping me go through it are on. All right. Yeah, that, that's but, fair enough. But, you know, as, as, we, as we found out through playing uh, together... That's not as big of a deal as I thought it would be, but it does make it more convenient to sort of run it together. Yeah. If you ever need to uh, run a dungeon or anything, let me know. I'll be happy to. to Yeah, no, I'm probably going to call you to start doing some of the. At least the Alexander raids, I think. Those would be one where. Oh, yeah. For, for the record, the Alexander raids are a little weird. You kind of have to go through, like, these puzzle things and then do the, the fight itself. Some mm-hmm. of the fights are memorable. Some of them are not. It's only in the later half that they get more interesting. Well, I was also thinking just in terms of... Because when we did... like, We had a lot to say about Crystal uh, Tower because we ran that together. And so at least for some of the... the either the Alliance raids or some of the, the dungeon raids, we should run at least one or two series together. Because I think that gives us a better experience just when we retell our thoughts in, uh, on on the series as a whole once we come to record again. You know what? That is perfectly fair. So for the next episode, again, I want you to get to 5.3, which is the right. end, which is the end of the Dragon Song War. You will know when you get to the end of the Dragon Song War. Right. But basically, that's the main thing. Once that is taken care of, since that's the case, maybe we should save... Uh, Hildebrand for after that. I think Hildebrand going into Stormblood would make more sense, especially because 
I believe the entirety is six. It, it goes through the entire patch, right? Yes, every every point five patch. Uh, so like the uh, three point one five was that was a, was a Hildebrand three point two five three point right. So so getting so getting to either get if we get to three point five five yeah then and then do Hildebrand we can do that all in one shot right. And I think because of how crazy Hildebrand is. That that pacing wise makes more sense, right? Versus because we have to do at least warring triads, void scent, and Alexander. Yeah, the void arc, the void arc. Yeah, to get through three point one to three point three, and then we can go into opening up Stormblood, and we have uh, the start with um, Hildebrand going into Stormblood proper. All right, that works. That works. Mm-hmm. So, so for next episode, I will like to say. 3.1 to 3.3, and let's try to do either Alexander or the Warring Triad. Mm-hmm. And then we'll save Hildebrand and whatever's left for for after the end of the Dragon Song War. Okay, that works with me. We'll we'll plan it out better. It's a little bit of a mess right now. Sure, it is, but we'll work we'll make it work. Yeah. But that's pretty much it for this episode of the Big Cat Aethercast. We'll see you all whenever I get this uh, chubby lion through it. Until next time. This has been Ray. And this has been Leo. Signing out. Later, guys, and have a good day. <laughs>